Hey, folks. Hi. I'm Waldo, and uh, I'm here to talk about pain. <laughs> if you care, this is my contact information. If you really care, that's a sticker that's making its world debut here, so feel free to hit me up or steal one from the tables later. I'm here to talk about, uh, the title of this talk is Comfortably Numb, or how corporate analgesia is actively hurting you. Um, but before we get into it, uh, I have a little housekeeping to do. This talk isn't necessarily endorsed by anybody. Um, I work for Datadog, they sent me here. Um, but I wrote this as one of a three-part series originally published for SysAdvent. Datadog didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> So I'm here on their behalf, uh, but they haven't necessarily approved this talk. But this is me, I'm just a boy staying in front of his community, asking to try to make things a little bit better. And for those of you who weren't aware, um, and thankfully not before the uh, Ignite karaoke, there is a DevOps drinking game. Uh, I don't recommend playing it today. One final point, I'm going to be moving kind of quickly, and I may be challenging some of your assumptions. Things are gonna move fast, but if you find that you're getting overwhelmed, stop and say the safe word clearly, <laughs> and we'll take a break. So with that, let's get on with the show. So when I say analgesia, uh, really the proper term is neuropathy. Uh, unfortunately, corporate neuropathy just didn't sound as good to me, so eh. um, But fortunately, the most common type of neuropathy is what's most relevant to this topic. Peripheral neuropathy is when there are problems with the nerves that are outside of the brain and the spinal cord. Now, at first blush, this is often re read as feels no pain. Um, and in fact, our, our popular media often consider the, considers this a superpower. Unfortunately, it's, it is what it says on the tin. You feel little to nothing. But it doesn't grant you better reflexes, or make you super nimble, or prevent you from bleeding out. Um, in fact, you're more likely to be clumsy because a lot of our sense of the world comes from our sense of touch. Going along with being clumsy, you have to be extra vigilant about your surroundings and yourself. People with peripheral neuropathy often have, uh, they have to frequently check themselves for cuts, bruises, and breakages uh, in order to treat infections and get the medical treatment that they need because they'll uh, easily break things without even noticing. Now, um, I did leave something out. In addition to numbness, people suffering often experience weakness in that the, the nerves that aren't responsive can't help accurately control the muscles that they're supposed to. So we'll come back to this. How many of you work at a company where your org chart looks like this? That's, yeah, at least half. Do you have a group that's responsible for making things but there's another group that's responsible for keeping those things available? If so, uh, I'll bet that releasing new features seem to take a really long time to make available once they've been written. Do you have problems with handoffs? Uh, does it take a long time when there are problems to get those resolved because you have to deal with intergroup communication? I mean, I'm not saying that there's finger pointing, But it's funny how everybody's theory about what's wrong and what needs to be fixed uh, involves the other group doing work. Huh. So I'm gonna talk about something that I normally wouldn't bring up in conversation and certainly not in a presentation. Um, but I'm gonna do it because I need you to feel something. I have a confession. After elementary school, I played baseball for a few years. Hi, I'm Waldo, and I used to play baseball. I gave it up in like middle high school because I wasn't great and I wasn't a coach's kid. Um, <laughs> but I was a decent catcher. And as catcher, I had some extra equipment. Uh, but there were two pieces of safety equipment that were really more important than the rest. 
And the reason for these should be obvious. <laughs> now, I wouldn't normally br uh, bring up gender or gender parts into a presentation, but I need to talk about pain. And for many people, gender parts are the easiest and quickest way to get there. Uh, so I need you to come along with me. And this isn't exclusive to men. Um, many of my female catcher peers, um, from them, I know that they experience similar pain. Uh, there's a lot of equivalency that we're not getting into, but a lot of them wear a cup too, because it hurts. So now it's time for a demonstration. Do I have any volunteers? <laughs> if you've ever experienced this kind of trauma, you, you know that it's a very special kind of pain. Um, and if, if you don't mind, please try to summon that in your head. I want you to remember that feeling if you don't mind. Um, for me, it's an all-encompassing, paralyzing, electrified feeling. I'm really savoring that right now. <laughs> now, if you see somebody get injured, you're going to feel something, right? Um, sympathy pain. It's not nearly as intense as getting hurt yourself, but there's still something there. When somebody tells you about being hurt, but you didn't see it happen, you didn't witness it, you might feel some sympathy pain for them, but it's a lot easier to shrug off. Let's have a live demo. No, not really. But let's say, hypothetically, uh, I call up two people to the stage, Terry and Sam. Now, if you see me kick Terry, all of you in the audience are going to feel sympathy, uh, and you're going to react to this in the same way as before. You're going to experience sympathy pain, but not Sam. I expect that Sam, when, she, when they came up, is going to wonder, are they going to be doing the kicking, or are they going to be kicked? And since they weren't asked to do anything, Sam's expecting to get kicked next. She felt sympathy pain, but now she has the added sinking feeling of, oh no, I'm next. Sam's anticipation is spiked. She's probably experienced some sympathy pain, but now it's overshadowed by the anxiety that she's now feeling. What's next? She expects she's going to be hurt. And this is why being on call is exactly like being kicked in the gender parts. <laughs> it's not just the heart-skipping feeling of being woken up at 3 a.m. It's or the fifth page that came in when somebody hit all the deploy buttons, even though you, an announcement went out that the artifact Rico isn't available. It's the feeling of being three yaks into a what the hell was I working on when this started? But then the pager goes off, and you lose all that context you'd built up. <laughs> when I tell you that I get no sleep because I was paged all night, you can feel sorry for me, especially if you're on the same rotation as I am. But if you're not on call rotation at all, that rates maybe up, that sucks, bro. Why? Because if you're not the primary on-call for the services that you provide, you're comfortably numb. You simply don't have to care as much. Now, don't get me wrong. Nobody's calling you a bad person. And sure, you have a professional mandate to put out quality products. However, if you're not the primary on-call for your applications, you just don't have the skin in the game. Hearing about an outage is a far cry from being woken up from sleep to diagnose and fix it. I'd argue that it's an even, even further gulf from seeing somebody get injured than being injured yourself. If you're not primary on call for the, you can sympathize, but you're just not gonna be hurt. This has the added benefit, <laughs> let's say, of contributing to us versus them thinking. Because the people who care for your products they know that there's a hierarchy of status. And that's fine for the majority. Right up until you're told that you're going to be going on call for your own apps. <laughs> whoa, whoa, 
whoa, whoa, whoa, what happened? <laughs> what happened there? Anybody ever see that discussion happen in your office? Well, by the way, developers are going on call. And there's a freaking riot. <laughs> Suddenly, a whole bunch of people now went from being a bystander to being expecting to be kicked next, because they know what they wrote. <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? <clears throat> Must be getting some cross, uh, cross. Now, I'm here to tell you that it's gonna be okay. Maybe you've never done this before. Maybe you've never been on call. We know you'll need help. You'll have to learn, but you will learn and you will grow. You have a greater appreciation for people who run things because you now, too, run things. You understand that failing gracefully is an art and it requires consideration. You'll lose patience for normal errors in logs and black box software that, uh, that doesn't allow for introspection. You'll develop a love for insight tooling and develop a passion for creating products that emit their own status and have resiliency built in and you will fail. You will screw up horribly, <laughs> and it will be okay. Because your company will realize that this is a tough transition, and that this is an investment in you and your future and your company. You will fail, but you won't be alone. You won't be a failure. Here's the thing. <laughs> see, see, those people who used to run the things for you, they're still around. Yes, it's a bit on the nose for me to refer to my past career as superheroes. But the number of times that one of my peers has been my hero is amazing. Because nobody can know everything. They, you just can't. You can only be an expert in so many things, but you can learn to be competent in many, many more. Those runners of things will still be around and they'll still be experts in finding and preventing failure modes. But they can and will teach you the competence of running things. I told you all that so I could tell you this. If you're running software for your customers and your org charts look like this, your company is probably organized wrong. The problem is that your org is, uh, is oriented around job function and not around products. The problem is Conway's law. The org chart will demonstrate to you how, uh, how your company cares about information. And it, most of the time, this shows that you care about job function, and that's how you want the information to flow. What are the products here? What are your products? You have people who make things, and you have people who run things. And since the people who make things are incentivized to change things, they want frequent change. The people who are incentivized to keep things stable and working and available, they want a slow rate of change. Congratulations, you have two separate groups who do radically different things, diametrically opposed to one another. Sure, eventually, in any given dispute, you're gonna go high enough that you come to a mutual boss, but then what happens? They either pick sides or tell you to work it out. That's helpful. The other problem with this is that work tends to be organized in projects or initiatives. And sometimes this is even how that work gets funded. Um, and most of the time, they're along the lines of a new feature or theme. Rarely, they may even make a uh, bug hunt or security fixes initiative, but these are typically when we're on, already on a way too old version. Like, uh, don't raise your hand if you still have Java 1.6 running. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the, the customer, the support or customer, uh, customer service department finally complains that enough to the right people that they finally get what I like to call an appeasement cycle, 
this stuff has been broken for so long, this eats up so much of our time, fine, we'll spend a week and, and try to knock some of it down. But that's about it. This pattern of adding things to the pile that are run by those who run things, uh, it's unsustainable. Sure, you can just add headcount uh, to solve some of it, but more new things are created faster than old things are removed. This is another way of calling out the problem of legacy. I like to define legacy as products that still serve customers and probably make money, but their do design thinking is no longer what's considered current. And it, these products probably aren't actively maintained. And no, that pack of maintenance engineers doesn't count. You know, they know that they're thought of as your C or D players, and that their job is to keep the legacy on life support. They're not there to improve things, they're just, to make, they're just there to make sure things are still around-ish. This is all awful, and it's entirely preventable. How I interject on your behalf, I'll tell you. Product teams. Product teams are autonomous, largely self-contained teams who, responsible for a set of problems, care for a suite of products. Let's drill into what I mean by that. Responsible for a set of problems, the team is charged with solving a problem, whether it's handling payments or an inventory management system uh, or just whatever the, the business needs. It's their job to solve. This team cares for a suite of products. Whatever solutions are brought to bear to solve the business problem, these are the people who are responsible for building and running it. Largely self-contained, the people who are needed uh, to define the problem, to define and solve the problem, they are who is on that team. Probably software engineers, you're probably gonna have some ops talent, you're almost certainly gonna want uh, some kind of quality, uh, quality assurance uh, expertise. But that, it's not limited to that. You may need DBA or security expertise local. Uh, but this also goes beyond tech. DevOps is not developers and operations and maybe QA and maybe security and maybe tacked on. It's the business. And it's a way of thinking about your business that transcends job role. So you might have a designer, or marketing, or business analytics folks. What if you need help with finance, or payments people, especially if those, that's the market you're serving within your company? You get them on your team as well. They become part of the product team. The team is autonomous, and this is the tricky one, and not for any, not for really a good reason, but this is, this is what makes middle management and the architect classes uh, really upset and itchy. This team is responsible for their own fate. They get to make their own decisions. Look, I don't care if you're Java shop or you only use Node.js on the front end. The team that is responsible for the app builds the app their way. And if they don't like it, they change it. Man, that works weird. So if they want a monolith for one service and a Kubernetes dockered functional microservices for another, fine. If they want to rewrite their application in the hacker news hotness of the week, fine. But, and that's a big but. Well, what about standards? Or what about interoperability, I cry on your behalf? Standards are overrated. Not all of them. Uh, ISO 8601 is pretty damn fantastic. You learn it, love it, use it. But by the time you have a plurality of teams in your company, probably, those standards are probably only followed-ish. Um, they may be causing more harm than good when you have teams responsible for their own fate. You're, the standards were built around a, a problem that you probably don't even have anymore. Now, what if I write something that's not up to the reference architecture standard? It ships. Because it didn't come to light 
that it wasn't following standards until it was too late anyway, right? Interoperability. That's probably, that's a pretty easily solvable. You have a programming API uh, interface, also known as an API. You document and define your inputs and outputs. Do yourself a favor and version it right from the get-go. But as long as you keep to the, the documented, defined inputs and outputs, you can change the implementation however you want. As long as the documentation is correct, <laughs> and the interface doesn't change, we're good. If you need to change the interface, you publish a new version. And when no one's using the old version anymore because you're already versioned and you're monitoring things built in, you know nobody's using it. Or you can go hunt down those last few stragglers. Then you can retire those old implementations. Now, how does this solve the problem of legacy? Legacy happens when a project is completed and handed off and nobody does development anymore. In the product team model, the products don't get handed off. Since the product team is responsible for development and running of the applications, <laughs> they keep the app evergreen. This is as simple as updating the app to run on the new version of Java or Rails or whatever you're using, just not letting things get too old. Now, this is where I hear the directors and managers of engineering start getting restless. Well, what about when I want people to start working on something else? Well, when the product team as a whole has more capacity to solve, has capacity to solve more problems, they can take on new products. Well, what if I just, you know, assign some people to another, uh, a different team? <whistles> yeah, about that. Um, thank you for coming. You may want to have a seat. So under the product team structure, the role of managers and directors changes. Namely, they don't manage work anymore. Under a product team, the product owner is in charge of the work. And um, I have a, a minor beef with Agile. I think the name product manager and product owner is backwards. Um, I don't know why they landed on it that way, but like to me, the, the product owner owns the product. So just ignore any uh, religious wars that you may be thinking of having right now. But the product owner is responsible for the hiring and firing to their team. They define that the, the problem that the team is going to solve, they provide context, and they set priorities. And the product owner assigns work to their people. The functional leadership role changes fundamentally. Your job is not the work anymore. I'm going to say that again. Functional leadership is not responsible for the work anymore. Your job now is knowledge and people. You coordinate who knows what and how people are solving problems. You're now going to run the internal community of your function in the company. You're going to get them together every so often and share knowledge and opinions and organize, say, conference attendance. You're actually going to do your scheduled one-on-ones and help with people's career development. You're going to organize your internal companies, uh, communities into guilds. Some places they're called tribes. I prefer the word guild for this use. And you're going to help the product owners with their talent. You got product, you, they have engineers who don't like, like the product they're working on, offer some team swaps. They need to hire a DBA, like for instance, when I ran a product team, I, you do not want me on a database. I'm gonna lev uh, leverage them heavily. You help the product owners with performance reviews and offer or coordinate mentorship. What you don't do is take people from one product team and assign them to another. I've worked under that, and it sucks enough having somebody quit your team and decide they just want to be somewhere else. 
it's even worse to have them stolen out from under you. Now, maybe you're more interested in making and running product uh, than taking care of people. Honestly, if you were an engineer and were promoted to management, this is even likely. Because let's face it, management's a career change, and you probably weren't given any training or support when you were promoted. This presents an excellent opportunity to reflect on the kind of management that you enjoy, uh, what you're good at, and the kinds of things that you would want to pursue. Now, in our time together, I've described how your org chart is causing pain, uh, but keeping the wrong people numb to it. I've described how organizing around products ensures that authority is al aligned with responsibility, while at the same time, solving the problems of legacy and unowned products. Preventing, this helps prevent useful products from becoming insecure and unmaintainable. In order to keep the team stable, a new model and agreement of where decisions happen, as well as how management is even fundamentally thought of, needs to happen. And finally, we've discussed how this model opens up new opportunities for innovation by allowing decisions to be made locally. Also, um, as new prospects for engineers as well as managers to consider their, the type of work and the products they're interested in. Thank you.